Hey, welcome back to Singularity Hub here at the summit in San Francisco. We're just off our lunch break. I was just told that I've got a nice melon, so you will have a nice melon in the shot today. Uh, don't ask me what this means. Leave your comments on the Facebook live stream. Uh, I am super, super stoked that we have um, Shannon Farley here uh, from Fast Forward. And uh, Fast Forward is really the only accelerator I know of focused on tech nonprofits, correct? Yes, we're the only one in the world. Well, tell, the me a, tell me a bit more about the work you're doing. How did you come up with the idea? Why is it necessary? Yeah. At Fast Forward, we believe the biggest social problems deserve the best technology. And so I co-founded Fast Forward with Kevin Berenblatt, who is a technologist. Uh, and I come from the social sector, and we were looking for ways to apply software and hardware to some of our most intractable problems. And we were really interested in the way that businesses like Mozilla and Wikipedia and Khan Academy had as nonprofits had exponential impact in the world. And we wanted to see that apply to housing and energy and education. And so we started with an accelerator. Uh, we're actually in our fourth year, and the teams are just doing unbelievably well. Last year they served 18 million people, and they are fundraising very successfully alongside their for-profit partners. They raised 28 million in follow-on funding uh, in the last year, and they've just the kind of work that they're doing is only possible through technology, but it's applied to an entirely new market. That's fascinating. Yeah. Uh, I'm curious. In, when you talk technology, so first of all, like yeah. this sounds extremely like Singularity University, so like <laughs> super happy to have you here. Um, when you talk technology, uh, what are the, the, the core technologies you see people apply today to solve problems and how are they solving them? How do they use technology in like practical ways? Yeah, this is really only possible because of the advances in exponential technology. So as technology has become increasingly less expensive to deploy, mm. you can apply a nonprofit business model to serve a customer that was otherwise untouched by technology. So one example is one of our alumni is Commonlit. And Commonlit was developed by a Teach for America teacher from rural Mississippi who walked into her classroom one day and realized she had dozens of different reading levels and no way to appropriately serve them. So she built Commonlit as a platform to have great literacy resources, things from Sports Illustrated and NPR, available for free for teachers always. So it is, uh, and she's able to do that as a nonprofit. She gets these royalty-free licenses. And because it's technology, it scales just beautifully. You know, she graduated from our accelerator, and by the end of the next school year, she was serving a third of middle schools and high schools in the U.S. Wow. Yeah, again, and for free for teachers. That's crazy. Yeah. That's amazing. Uh, a curious, uh, curious thought is like, why nonprofit? Why are not doing this as for profits? I mean, we, you know, like you hear on our stage a lot about like the, the power of startups and yeah. it's typically assumed startup equals for profit. Sure. Uh, you focus on a very specific different area, which is nonprofit. Sure. Couldn't we solve these with for profits? What we, tell me a little bit more about like. Our organizations are organized as nonprofits, not just because of tax status, because it's a business model strategic decision. Hmm. Like one great example is Watt Time. Watt Time uh, was developed by PhD students, Gavin, um, Gavin coming out of Berkeley, and what he discovered was you could put code on top of smart devices to tell it when to pull the cleanest energy from the grid. Oh yeah, okay. And Gavin calls, the reason he is involved as a nonprofit is because he is interested in mission sourcing. He wants his technology in every smart device on the planet. Mm. And if a, you can do that as a nonprofit right. far more easily than as a for-profit. And in fact, they just announced with Microsoft that Watt Time has now been integrated into the Azure cloud platform wow. to teach it when to pull the cleanest energy from the grid. Wow. And you can you could only do that kind of a partnership as a nonprofit. Interesting. And do you find, um, you mentioned that your startups raised, what, $28 million? Eight million dollars? follow-on funding. So they raised this as nonprofits. So yeah. presumably they raise it from different capital sources as well, right? Because the typical like Silicon Valley venture capital community is probably not conducive to a nonprofit, which doesn't have, kind of by definition, never has an exit, right? Right. So they're raising it from 
institutional philanthropy, which is sort of what we understand as foundations and um, other donor-advised funds. They're actually also raising it from VCs who are interested in keeping some of their personal, por their philanthropic portfolio and applying it to technology. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Huh. Okay. Um, what do you think in terms of like, I want to get back because you're in technology, right? Yeah. Like you're really focused on, so it's social businesses, but rooted and anchored in technology. So very close to what Singularity's heart is. Sure. Um, what are the, the big tech trends you see being used and deployed today? Yeah. And then as a follow on question, like what do you see is like the stuff you see in the future? Mm -hmm. So we're seeing technologies that are out here on the floor applied mm. to social problems. Um, AI is a huge trend in the nonprofit space. Uh, the biggest tech nonprofit that's deploying it at the moment is Crisis Text Line. Okay. Uh, and they have this really interesting statistic. They found through their platform that if you write the, if a child writes ibuprofen in their text to their crisis responder, it's 16 times more likely to indicate that they need an emergency crisis response than mm. suicide. And they wow. were able to do that with machine learning. Uh, and one of the exciting things about it being a nonprofit is all that data is open. So as Crisis Text Line software gets smarter and develops, we as other people building AI can use their learnings and apply it to what else we're building. That's powerful. Uh -huh. In our current cohort of classes, we have a lot of chatbots being deployed for things like online harassment, reporting of police interactions, and they're able to do that because it's cheaper to deploy it, um, but also because you know, for our entrepreneurs in this class, 100% have personally experienced the problem they went out to solve. And so they really understand the customer problem in a different way, and they're taking these new technologies and applying them to customers that are sort of untouched uh, in other parts of the tech field. Let me dwell on that point a little bit. Um, yeah. How important do you think it is to experience the customer pain firsthand yeah. versus uh, like say through design thinking, you know, methodologies, experiencing it as a kind of as an outsider and trying to get into the into the problem space. I believe it's essential. Mm. You know, when we talk to entrepreneurs, both for and nonprofit throughout Silicon Valley, we say build something customers love. Well, if you are the primary customer, you're going to build something maybe that you don't love that you have to have it, but you certainly desperately need it, and your commitment to the problem is just different. Um, it means that we have these really exciting entrepreneurs that, again, like probably not seen in other parts of the tech community, that their tech is fantastic and the problems they're solving can really change lives. Oh, I saw one of our teams, our alumni, is out on the floor here. Yeah. Just Fix NYC. Just Fix NYC is a web and a mobile platform that allows tenants to report when they have bad acting landlords. So when you have black mold or rats, uh, you're able to report and it fills out all of the legal documentation you would need to go to housing court. The founders developed it because they were in buildings in which these problems were happening, mm -hmm. right? And they were in communities in which their right. neighbors desperately needed these resources. And so that's what they built. They're committed to the problem in a really different way. I think human-centered design is an important part of the product development experience. And we work with our teams to apply it as they think about new features and build out their technology. But there's something special about someone who understands the problem intimately and is able to execute on it. Interesting. And so you're around for four years. You've seen dozens, if not hundreds, of companies you've worked with. You've seen, surely have seen hundreds upon hundreds of pitches. I'm curious, like, what makes you believe in a team? Like, what makes you to say, you're the ones who are going to solve this problem, or you're the ones worthy our attention, yeah. and these guys probably not quite so much. I think that's why it's interesting because it looks a lot like the for-profit sector. Uh -huh. Like we look first and foremost at the leader. Do we think they have the grit and gumption to pull off this idea? Do they understand the problem intimately and so they're going to be committed to it for the long haul? And are they able to attract resources, money, but also other employees and attention that will help them scale their vision for good? Are there like objective ways to look at that? Or is it really more like the gut feel? Like a lot of like VCs I talk to, they're yeah. like, yeah, ultimately it comes down to gut feel. It's gut, yeah. Gut. Um, you know, I think the difference in nonprofit investing, if you will, is that the 
you may not personally have experience with the problem. So there are uh, objective indicators that we're looking at as well, like what is the research on this problem? Is this actually possible to be solved? Could this particular solution scale? Like we are looking at some objective criteria, but yeah, it is a, it's a feeling. Like, are the, is this entrepreneur able to attract you as an investor? Because if they can attract you, they may be able to attract others. Right. Um, interesting. Let me get back to the second part of the question you didn't answer because I'm super <laughs> curious. Like, in terms of like technology, like where do you see technology? What are you most excited about in terms of technology? And where do you see technology in your field, in the yeah. way you're looking at, has the biggest impact for change? I think what's exciting about tech nonprofits at the moment is we're seeing technologies that we read about all the time applied to new problems. So one of our alumni is Democracy Earth Foundation. Mm -hmm. They're using the blockchain to make it possible for incorruptible voting processes, which matters a lot in a world that's deeply concerned about democracy, right? Making sure that democracy is 100% transparent uh, and incorruptible, it will make a big difference in the kind of world that we live in. So. You know, they're not, they are developing code to build the platform on, but blockchain has been around for a while. So I'm excited about seeing these newer technologies applied to our oldest problems. And I believe Democracy Earth, actually, they're not just like a theoretical, like we write some code and, you know, we hope for the best, but they actually have deployed this in very real uh, yeah. context, right? They deployed it in Colombia. So in Colombia, during the peace referendum la uh, last year, they deployed a pilot to look at those who were in the diaspora who had a vested interest in how the police referendum turned out because diaspora everywhere sends remittances home. They have a vested mm. economic interest as well as a social and emotional interest in the outcome. They got to vote. Now, it doesn't mean that uh, the votes had any political sway at this time, mm. uh, but it was another data point for Colombian nationalists to see what their citizens around the world were thinking about this issue. And I believe this was initiated by literally the government, right? It's not just like yeah. a, a grassroots thing, but like where the government said, like, we want to get the we want to get those data points. Yeah, right? the government brought it in because it matters. It matters right. to the country what the citizens who are contributing to the GDP of the country think about what's happening politically. And, you know, that matters in other countries as well, what the rest of the world thinks is happening. So you can imagine a world in which blockchain voting is deployed for any number of issue areas. So. I, one of the more curious questions I find um, is this, this dichotomy between the belief technology will fix it, mm -hmm. which you know we are probably somewhat guilty, I am probably somewhat guilty of, and then this, this, this idea of like, or this knowledge, like it's really about people and influencing people and governance and policy, sure. and of course they need, they need to come together, yeah. but where do you see, where, where do we need to put more emphasis on to really get to the change we need to see in the world? from your perspective? Yeah. I'm a techno-optimist. You know, Welcome I started, to the club. <laughs> right? uh, I started my career in uh, social, working in social justice philanthropy, and I saw on the ground throughout the world how mobile phones had totally changed the way my grantees were interacting with each other, but nobody was building products for them. Mm. And so I feel like this is the second digital divide. The first digital divide was about access, and now with mobile being ubiquitous, that's nearly solved. Right. What is not solved is products are not being built for these customers. Right. And I feel until that happens, they, those customers don't get to participate in our workforce, in our governments, and even in our communities. So, you know, personally, I believe deeply in the power of a community garden, for example, mm -hmm. but I would like anyone to be able to know like how you register for a community garden, where you find the best seeds, how to make sure that your water sources are responsible, and you should be able to do that from your phone. Gotcha. And until that happens, I don't believe there will be an equitable distribution of resources. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Good. I'm cu yeah, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm curious. So the work you're doing is just phenomenal. I'm a huge supporter of your of your organization, of course. You've mentored our teams. I've mentored, on yes. yes. I had the great pleasure of, of meeting your teams and mentoring. Um, how can get how can people like the viewers of this stream, how can they get involved? There's so many things you can do. These startups, like any startup, need all kind of support. So uh, we actually have a job board on our website, ffwd.org. 
and you can find any open jobs in the tech nonprofit sector, the over 400 wow. tech nonprofits in the world. Um, they're also looking for volunteers and board positions, and that's all listed on the job board. If you are interested in supporting fast forwards entrepreneurs specifically, we can help you find ways to invest in them, both your money and your time and attention. Um, but you know, one of my favorite things to do is we have an alumna called CareerVillage.org, okay. which is a, it's like Quora for career advice. It's a platform oh, yeah. that connects through LinkedIn and you can answer career questions of youth from around the world. So if you have 15 minutes today, go on careervillage.org, answer a kid's question, and I promise you will feel better about the day huh. and technology for good. I love that. Yeah. So here you have it. Go to ffwd.org. Yes. Look for jobs. <laughs> uh, go, go to careervillage.org. Yes. Uh, answer a question right now, 15 minutes. I'm actually giving you about five minutes until we get to the next interview. So wrap it up. Uh, go there, answer a question, get a job. Shannon, thank you so much thank for being so here. Much. It was, was amazing. Really thank and we're back in just a few minutes with more good stuff from the summit here. Thank you.
And we're back here at Singularity University Hub on the show floor at the summit in San Francisco where, as people tell me, because I haven't been out of here, uh, it's actually pretty foggy. We're here today with uh, Abhi Ramanan, who was part of our Global Solutions Program two years ago, if I'm not mistaken, yeah, right, 2015, co-founded a company called Impact Vision, about which we will talk quite a bit. I'm super stoked to have you here. Thank you so much for having me. Thrilled to be here. You also co-founded two other companies. Yes, I and did. Smaller, not really technology orientated social enterprises. Yeah. And we'll get there uh, in a minute. Yeah. So, Impact Vision yeah. uses hyperspectral imaging yes, exactly. to tackle the one trillion dollar <laughs> problem of food waste, correct? Yeah, exactly. That's so talk the a little problem. bit more about what yeah. is it, how did you come up with the idea? Yeah, absolutely. So I'd been working in and around food for a while. I started a food business focused specifically on supply chain waste, but looking more at the consumer end of things, so creating a secondary marketplace for surplus products and trying to attribute a commercial value to that to start to challenge consumer perceptions around surplus. And the reason why I was really excited to go to SU is because I'd always been more community focused, kind of grassroots, and the opportunity to address some of the challenges in the food system in a more systemic way, looking at closer to harvest and using technology was really appealing. And so we actually, it just all started, we had a lecture by someone who was making satellites with hyperspectral capabilities. And he actually encouraged the class, look for on-earth applications, the sensors are becoming smaller and cheaper, and we're going to start to see kind of every industry wants non-invasive information. Um, it's of kind of great value, particularly for products which are perishable, have a short shelf life. Being able to do that type of analysis has a lot of value. And we've changed the core concept of the business, has changed very little since that summer, two years ago, which is to provide this analytics layer to interpret this world of new information from these sensors. So let me, I know that the audience, of course, surely knows what hyperspectral imaging is. <laughs> I have to admit, when we first met, like, you know, I was in that lecture. Yeah. I was like, oh, that's interesting. I kind of knew somewhat what it is, but I really didn't fully grok it. Would you mind explaining to the audience a little bit, like, what is it? What is exciting about hyperspectral? Yeah. How does it work? Yeah. And how do you use it in your particular case? Yeah, absolutely. So hyperspectral imaging combines two different technologies. Spectroscopy, which is a really well-established technique, technology that's existed for about 60 years. And that's the process by which you acquire chemical information from a single pixel. And hyperspectral imaging combines that technique with computer vision. So you're basically acquiring chemical information across hundreds or thousands of pixels. So why is this important? By looking at something, right? By, by from looking. an image, by measuring reflectance. So you're looking okay. at reflectance across hundreds of continuous wavelengths, as opposed to just the three channels by which you and I or a traditional camera processes light. And what this allows you to do is access information in different parts of the visible spectrum, near infrared, and other parts of the electromagnetic spectrum, where information exists in the world, it's just we're not able to see it. And so we then make software that gives information about things like the tenderness of meat, the ripeness of fruits, the freshness of fish, which either today are measured by destructive tests or visual inspections or aren't measured at all. And this is one of the reasons why there's a lot of waste and fraud in, in the food system, in the supply chain, because it hasn't yet to kind of benefit from these, these types of digital technologies that other industries have benefited from. And I mean, food is central to everything from water to energy. It's also very emotive. It crosses cultures. And I think it's, it's, it's a tragedy that it has not had the, the benefit of technology. And that's why we're kind of trying to apply these, these tools to address some of those problems. So to explain this to my grandma. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So what you're saying is effectively, if I get this right, please yeah. correct me, right? Yeah. It's like I can point a camera, let's say, at an apple yeah. and can determine how fresh that apple is or yeah. if it has gone bad. Exactly. So part of it is around being really specific, but basically that's the premise. You take an image and you're able to understand information about certain quality parameters. Mm -hmm. We try not to talk too much about things like texture, taste, freshness, because gotcha. those are more subjective kind of in human mm -hmm. concepts, but we look more at like shelf life in the context of like pH as a measurement or tenderness in the context of pressure that's applied in Newtons to cut meat. So how it actually works is we, let's take tenderness of meat. We take a hyperspectral image of a steak. We then carry out the destructive measurement, which is you measure the pressure applied in Newtons to a piece of meat. 
you repeat this process a few hundred times, you build a model that correlates information from the image, references it against the ground truth measurement. After you've done that a certain number of times, the system has learned to make that correlation by itself, and you don't need to use that destructive measurement again. And then at that point, that can be integrated in a distribution center within a company's supply chain processes, and they don't need to rely on those destructive tests anymore. So ultimately, as a very simplified headline, I guess, yeah. you're getting rid of the best by date, right? Because you're giving me a real best yes. by date. Or we are giving it, we're giving a much more accurate yeah. and, um, use. And today those dates are set in a really regressive way. And so you're actually right. losing a lot of value of the product. And then you have issues with markdowns in store, in store shrink, like in store waste and all these kinds of things, which are partly due to a lack of information or poor quality information and information that's only obtained on a sample basis. Gotcha. Fascinating. So, where are you roughly today? Yeah. And I'm curious, like, what do you see is like the longer term, not just for your particular company, but like in, in hyperspectral imaging generally, what is the longer term like trajectory we're yeah. seeing like the next five or ten years? Like, I what do we need to look out for? What should we get excited about? Yeah, so a lot of people within the community, which is still fairly small, it's still a fairly emerging technology, particularly for industrial applications, well established in space, they talk about it as being similar to the next GPS. So I think within the next couple of years, we can, less than kind of max five years, within 10 years, I think we probably will have completely new ways of processing information. Smartphones probably won't exist, but on a shorter time frame, we have a partnership with a company, for example, that's developing consumer grade prototypes to start mass production in a year and a half to two years, which wow. will, they'll cost around $200 when they're when produced. So within a couple of years, sensors integrated into smartphones, consumers will have access to this technology. B to C spectroscopy devices are already available on the market. The reason why this is kind of valuable, is like an evolution of that technology, is because you can only tell so much from a single pixel. And it's great for some applications when you're measuring homogenous products, but if you want to look at complex matter like me, if you do one pixel, it could be a lean pixel, it could be a fat pixel, you're not able to say anything about intramuscular fat, for example. For that, you need to measure the distribution of parameters, and that's what the computer vision element allows you. But in order for, so the hardware is becoming a commodity, three or four companies in the last year are doing innovations within that space. And so increasingly, the complexity is in the analytics, where before you had servers that could do like processing and normalization of the images and stuff, all of that's going to have to happen in the cloud and partly in the device. And that's, I think, what a lot of the development over the next couple of years needs to happen. But yeah, I think within two years, you can, with not every application in the world, but for some applications, you'll be able to go to a supermarket, take a photo of a fish and find out the species. That's wow. feasible. Yeah. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, we're, um, we're excited. I can tell. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we first met at the Global Solutions Program 2015. Yes. We just wrapped up 2017 on Friday. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about your journey. Like, for you coming out of the program to the point where you're now the CEO of, uh, of a company in a super high, hot, emerging, small community <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. field. Yeah, absolutely. So I d didn't go to Singularity having with a background in technology, and I do think it is of great testament to SU that it has enabled someone with my background who had like domain knowledge, had started businesses before, but to be able to go on to start a company in a, quite a technical field. I think SU is quite unique in the world for being able to give people that opportunity. So I think that's been really transformative. I do love working in technology. There are challenges, of course, but it's definitely enabled. I'd always been interested in technology, but then I studied social science. And so it's allowed me to go on to start um, a technology company and travel all around the world, get a really deep understanding of certain trends. Um, I think the, a really cool thing about SU is that you are essentially building a business for some point in the future. And finding a way to sustain yourself during that initial couple of years can be challenging, but you rarely see many other places that are kind of teaching you to build for a certain inflection point or look at certain trends. And that's probably the biggest thing that I took away from SU, like project into the future and create something for a point at which everyone has 5G and you know one billion people are going to be coming online and computation and image processing and all these things are becoming more and more widespread. So look at how you can utilize all of that. And that's a really valuable, I think without sounding like I've been too uh, indoctrinated because I do think there are absolutely limits to technology, but I think that's probably a little bit around that mindset yeah. um, shift. What was most surprising for you in this in this journey, for you personally? I started this thinking I will get questioned a lot about being a non 
technical founder, and I thought the technology would be the majority of it. In fact, it is very much that 80-20 rule. I very rarely, A, get questioned about the technology in a capacity that I can't answer it. In fact, I probably overcompensated, and now people think I have a PhD in imaging. And I clearly <laughs> tell, like our opening clearly was a PhD in imaging. <laughs> Whereas the business component, the value proposition, what is the return on investment going to be for companies that have single figure profit margins, haven't mm. updated their software since the 1970s, and would typically rather make an investment in a better pH meter than a sensor and software. Food industry doesn't do um, software as a service. It does, it's, it, so that by far has been the biggest surprise. I thought I knew food and I absolutely didn't. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Talking about new food. Yeah. Um, You had two companies. Funny enough, like through the two years we know each other, I just now learned their names. <laughs> yeah, yeah. One is called Pappy's Pickles. Yes. And Day Old. And Day Old, yeah. Um, tell us a tiny little bit about like what were you doing with those? What were they attacking? What was the problem you were attacking? Yeah, so Pappy's Pickles is, I'm Tamil, so I grew up my whole life knowing about the conflict in Sri Lanka. I never felt like there was much that I could personally particularly do around it. And then I became, actually was inspired by a company based in San Francisco called La Cochina. And it's the first, it was one of the first incubators for Mexican, female Mexican entrepreneurs mm. to start food businesses or work in, in food, which again is a kind of very male dominated industry. And that kind of spawned a lot of like social enterprise, food social enterprises around the world. And I was really interested in working specifically with Sri Lankan migrant and refugee women who came to the UK during the conflict. Unemployment is really high in those communities and migrant women and refugee women are some of the most kind of marginalized groups in society. Employment is really core to the process of integration. So it's, it's a catering company and we cater weddings, pop-ups, wow. we um, do street food and yeah, do like mini restaurants and we basically train women from those communities to become chefs and earn an independent income and all the kind of additional benefits that come from participating in meaningful wow. employment. And the second one, Day Old, is also to do with food waste. We work with organic bakeries and collect the products that they don't sell at the end of the day, package them in beautiful Day Old branding, deliver to offices, places like PwC, and do like the more softer approach to awareness raising, and then donate the profits to child hunger charities in London to highlight those twin issues beyond just the model of donating surplus food to people in poverty, which doesn't actually address either of those underlying issues. It's about creating value, creating a commercial product, and reaching more mainstream audiences as well. That's awesome. Yeah. There's a, uh, a restaurant here in, in the Bay Area, uh, it's called the Mayfield. It has yes, a bakery attached it. to it. Yeah. And what I love about the Mayfield is when you go there, kind of like on their second serving in the evening, like before they sh close shop, they regularly bring you the remains of the day from the bakery and just give them out to their patrons, right? right. They basically say like, hey, do you want to take a loaf of bread? Yeah, because yeah, we were, yeah, yeah. you know, we were because to throw it away, right? It. Yeah. Which is amazing. Yeah, I had, so, I've heard of the restaurant. I didn't know they did that, so, but that's, super that's cool. great. Yeah. Yeah. I'm curious, um, kind of like in the, in the wrap up, um, mm. so you've been in, through GSP. Yeah. Uh, outside of the two technologies you now have a PhD in, which is <laughs> hyperspectral. I wouldn't, I wouldn't go and, that far. Uh, and image as well as AI. Mm. Like, what are you most, <laughs> What are you most interested in? Like, what is like what excites you in terms of technology? What do you think has the biggest yeah. potential for change? It's a quite a big question. So within food, I think the alternative protein movement is monumental. I think in 20, 30 years, we'll look back and think it was absolutely abhorrent that we farmed animals in the way that we do today. So before I spoke earlier today, Memphis meats I think are absolutely incredible. So there's kind of various strands to this. There's the whole pea protein side of things but they're actually engineering tissue cultures in labs. It's not synthetic meat, it's actual meat produced in, and I think it's something like today, 23 calories in terms of grain is required to produce one calorie of beef, and they've got it down three to one. So wow. in terms of energy efficiency, it's amazing. So yeah, I'm really excited about that. Less the B to C chocolate covered crickets thing, more looking at like, there's another really interesting company called Geltor that have created a synthetic or a biological replacement for gelatin. So I think what's really exciting is only 2% of potential plant-based plants have been researched that have the pro properties to replace animal protein. So it's only kind of opportunity ahead. So I think that's really exciting. On a completely unrelated note, obviously, um, a lot of the stuff with around Neuralink and human brain interface and how to increase the capacity of the brain. No, I, I don't think of the brain, I think it's a bit problematic to think of the brain as a computer. <laughs> 
But I do think that a lot of the work that is going on around increasing the capacity of brain, a lot of research into memory. Um, of course, AI is super hyped, but I think neural networks are really interesting. I was reading recently about a technique um, called hierarchical temporal memory, mm -hmm. which more mimics the kind of neocortex and the way that it's structured in terms of, I think, yeah, anything that's looking at memory and how, how to create that and how to store information and process it more effectively, I think it's really interesting, and I, I and more opportunities for in developing countries. I still think that crowdsourcing or like utilizing the power of people, particularly for smallholder farmers and companies that are kind of aggregate simple, still SMS-based systems, but have managed to reach a tipping point where they're aggregating a lot of information in terms of like those kind of business models. I think is really interesting. Lot of a lot of great stuff, like interesting stuff in energy, blockchain as well. I think has. I, I still sometimes struggle to see the like absolute use case for information to be distributed. I do get it, but it's. So I think that it has a lot of value in very specific, like some more specific. But I, I think probably I need to understand it a little bit, a little, a little bit better. But yeah. Well, probably. so clearly you did your your PhD in a whole bunch of areas. That's amazing. <laughs> no, um, I wouldn't say that, but yeah. So with that, I want to wrap it. Um, for those of you out there who are not yet plugged into with your neurofrontal cortex into your <laughs> Facebook stream. Uh, we will be back in a few minutes. Uh, this was Abby from uh, Impact Vision. Check out its impact. Your URL is impact, impactvi.com. Impact yeah. So check that out. Um, Abby, thank you so much for thank being you here. So this was for awesome. Having me. This was great. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.
Welcome back to Singularity University's Global Summit here in San Francisco. It's still foggy out there, I hear. Uh, I am super, super, super excited to have a very, very special guest with us today, Sylvia Earle. And let me get this record straight here. Sylvia was Time Magazine's first hero of the planet. She was called a living legend by the Library of Congress, is the founder of Mission Blue, and we'll surely talk about this a little bit, and has been or is a National Geographic explorer in residence, of which we actually have one in our faculty as well. Um, Sylvia, I'm super, super excited to be here. You truly dedicated your life to the oceans. Um, how comes? Why, why did you make that commitment? Without the ocean, none of us would be here. Mm. <laughs> and I just found the ocean to be, what, irresistible as a child, and I still find it so. There's just endless diversity of life, maybe not endless, but we're still exploring the ocean. Yeah. We've only literally scratched the surface, so there's so much to discover there. Any little kid can look at the ocean and find things that no one has seen before. It's really remarkable that we live at a time of the, the greatest era of exploration. It's just beginning. Yeah. Which is interesting because on the flip side of that, you've got people who are saying we should all go to Mars and live a happy life on a pretty barren, reddish planet and probably grow our crops in our own uh, manure, right? Um, right. I love the idea of going to Mars as an exploratory venture. I uh -huh. think it's in the nature of humans to always want to peel back the layers of the unknown. And I mean, we, we look up into the sky and... How could you not want to know everything about everything? At the same time, this part of the universe, our own home, is still mostly unexplored. Mm. What I find fascinating is that the more we learn, the more we know, the more we know that we don't know, and right. the, the, the more exciting it gets. Right. The more realistic, I suppose, in response to the challenge, how do we take this home of ours and make it continue to work so we can prosper as a part of it? Throughout all of civilization, we have drained, drawn down the assets. When I came along, there were only two billion people. Wow. And already, yeah. we could see the impact of our ability to cause other species to go extinct. The one that I'm most concerned about is ourselves, that we could so modify, so alter the nature of the nature of Earth that it will not be suitable for us. The key is <laughs> looking at the trends, not a thousand years ago or even a hundred years, but in the last 50 years, we have got the evidence. We've been increasingly able to gather evidence. And we can see the melting of polar ice coincident with the increase in carbon dioxide right. and methane. And who's responsible? Look in the mirror. <laughs> that we know. The loss of diversity on the land or the forests. The, look at whether you're talking elephants or snow leopards or, or whatever, or the ocean with whales. At least we largely stopped the commercial killing of whales, although entanglement, the, what we throw into the ocean is plastic <laughs> junk and other forms of debris, through entanglement, through the contact with what we put into the ocean, old fishing nets, old crab pots and so on, the loss of marine mammals every year, the dolphins, the whales, the sea lions, and other on the order of 300,000 animals are killed just because of the trash we put into the ocean. And then there are the birds and turtles and the fish. Anyway, so the thing is, if we didn't know, why bother? Why care if you don't know? But we do know. The evidence is there. Yeah. That's the good news. We've got more insight, more new discoveries about how the planet functions how we're related in the solar system, in the universe. 
especially how our lives are dependent on the blue part of the planet, the, or the water. And, and what is your what is your sense of how how far are we like down the path of it becoming irre irreversible? Right. This is in climate change. This is like the notion of the runaway climate, right? Where oh. the tipping point can come, where we probably don't have control over it anymore, right? When you think about the ocean, where are we on this on this on this scale? We can make projections. We look at we've already lost half of the coral reefs, yeah. either either gone gone dead or in a state of sharp decline. True with mangroves, seagrass meadows, coastal marshes like this, but also wildlife in the ocean. The tunas, bluefin tuna. The latest numbers suggest less than 3% of what there were in 1980. So, you know, we, we're really good at killing. Oh, we're so good at killing things. Uh, whether it's trees or birds, or now we're, we've turned our attention to wildlife in the sea with technologies that make not just the finding and the extraction, but also the marketing on a global scale of life from the ocean. But At the same time, we're also technologically superior as compared to any time in the past in understanding why it matters. So we don't have tuna fish anymore, so what? No whales. If you've never seen a whale, why would you care? What's a whale ever done for me, right? Yeah. But when you look at the whole picture and you can see the chemistry of the ocean tied to the chemistry of life, the the eat and be eaten, the, chemi the chemical pathways of nutrients. And understand that when you take a breath, <laughs> in a way you should thank a whale because they consume phytoplankton, but they give nutrients back that makes the phytoplankton prosper, which generates the oxygen that we breathe. Right. I mean, it, it sounds a little complicated, but it isn't when you think about it. A kid, kids are understanding it and they're getting it and they're taking adults and saying you've got to do something yeah you know, look at the trends when i'm your age what's going to be left of the planet usually parents want the world to be a better place for their children yeah. and you, you want them to have at least a life as good as you have had i know my parents felt that way about my brothers and me And it's just a common, common ground that people really want the future for their kids. And so the kids of today should be saying, Mom, Dad, what are you doing? Because here are the trends. Air, water, wildlife, ocean. We have solutions. That's the good news. Yeah, before we get there, I actually want to talk about the solutions because that's where the whole part comes yeah. because I'm feeling pretty down at the moment, no, trust me. The good um, news is we know. Right. We got the you knowledge. have actually created or named something called Hope Spots, yes. which that sounds just beautiful. Tell me a bit more about what are they, what is the concept? Well, a century ago, the United States actually, on a, something that already begun, people protecting the land because you could see if you don't embrace it, a place with proactively, with care, it is likely to be homogenized and turned into something other than the distillation of all that has preceded us. These wild places, wild rivers, wild forests, old growth forests that are the result of a lot of interaction among for a long period of time with solutions to questions we raise, like, who are we? Where do we come from? Where are we going? How does the planet work anyway? And national parks, the national park system. Mm, what a great idea. Yeah. Partly inspired because of beautiful landscape, landscapes, places where for recreation, but now they've become even more important as centers of biodiversity, places where all around things have been changed, lost, simplified, covered over with cement or whatever. But here are these special places that if 
if we hadn't been careful about protecting them 100 years ago, or 50 years ago, or even 10 years, even last year, some remarkable moves were taken to take care of places that, and, and around the world. This is an idea that has, I think it's because people recognize our dependence on nature. And it isn't just because they're beautiful, aesthetically, or even morally the right thing to do to save old trees and to not let the last panda be killed yeah. or the last anything, but that we are connected. In the ocean, it's the same thing, blue parks, mm. blue parks, inspired by the success of parks on the land to do the same thing in the ocean, but, but underpinned with a new understanding that we need the natural systems that keep us alive. And the, at this point, to identify those most critical areas to first, one would like to think, here's all of nature, do no harm, mm -hmm. work within the systems. Right. And so working with the International Union for the Conservation of yeah. Nature, IUCN, Mission Blue has developed a framework, also working with ESRI, a California-based yeah. company that, you know, so it's connected with GIS, you know exactly on the planet where you are and you can <laughs> layer various kinds of data. So building a framework within which we can input data, people can nominate places that they think are important and say why this place matters and what you're going to do about it and have a go-to place that can then be celebrated uh, we're also working with Google to, to be able to show these hope spots on Google Earth. And so yeah. it's a way to empower people at the local level. In fact, it's critical that that happen, as well as at the governmental level. And not just for your backyard or out to the edge of our exclusive economic zones around the world, a concept that started in the 1980s and now you know we've sort of extended our boundaries as a nation out 200 miles which doubles the size of the United States. In the case of little island countries such as Palau or Kiribati or French Polynesia you've got a much larger ocean than you do land but then there's the high seas beyond that's half of the world it is beyond national jurisdiction where we have to work together to protect the global commons because that's where the heavy lifting takes place in generating oxygen, taking up carbon, holding the planet steady, governing climate and weather. And so it's Hope Spots, I think the concept gives a name to a concept and I hope, inspires hope, that we're not without power. We have the capacity armed with knowledge to look in the mirror, understand each of us who and what we are and what our power is to do something to make better choices about what we eat, about what we wear, about right. what we buy, you know, all those things in the context of protecting the natural world and being mindful of our impact and every person counts. And if we pull together, anything's possible. It's really wonderful. I, we are running out of time. It's so, I, would, I could talk to you literally for the rest of this conference. I could listen to you for clearly more than the rest of this conference. Sylvia, thank you so much for being here. I just want to point out, um, so you founded Mission Blue, right. and if you want to know what Mission Blue is all about and how you can get involved, you want to go to mission-blue.org, mission-blue.org, and uh, Sylvia. Deep Hope. Deep Hope. Yeah, that's with the company that I started, Deep Ocean Exploration and Research. Oh, fantastic. Based in Alameda, looking at submersibles that we can engage the public so everybody can get down. That's awesome. So also check out Deep Hope. We will be back online in a couple minutes. Sylvia, thank you so much for being here. It was a pleasure and honor. Truly amazing. Thank you. Thank you.
I'm being very focused on. Singularity Hub, Pascal Finet on the show floor here at the Global Summit from Singularity University in San Francisco. Just a reminder, it's still foggy out there as it was 15 minutes ago. I'm super stoked, super, super stoked uh, to have Nicolas Alcala here. You're the founder of a company called Future Lighthouse. You were also one of our graduate students in the Singularity Global Solutions Program in 2015 as Abby was. Yeah. And Tell us a bit about Future Lighthouse. It's in VR. So, so I give you away. This talk will be all geeking out on VR, AR, future of storytelling. <laughs> Super excited. Tell us about Future Lighthouse. What future, are you doing? Future Lighthouse. Uh, future Lighthouse, uh, we founded it two years ago, right before going to Singularity. And it's basically, so it started as a content studio. We wanted to tell stories in VR because it's the best medium ever invented to tell stories. And because it's a new industry and everything was new and you know, I was coming from film and I was like all about trying to break up things and then rethinking how movies are made and how they're distributed. Um, with VR it was like, hey, we don't need to, to break anything. We just need to invent it from scratch and think about how we want it to be. Right. Um, so it started as such, but then at the same time, I've always been very connected with technology and, and I love where technology and storytelling merge. And I believe we tell the stories that we tell thanks to technology. I mean, writing, photography, all of those are technologies that have reshaped how we tell stories. So uh, in the end, we are also creating technologies to think about what's next for storytelling. We talked about this, I talked with, uh, with a guest about this earlier, like this idea of every new medium in the beginning seems to emulate the old medium, right? How do you break out, and I know that you guys are not emulating the old medium, and you just hinted at this. How do you avoid this? Like, how do you, like... I think, I think with VR we have a, a rare gift because it's so different from the previous ones that from scratch, it's like you're encouraged to do so. So if you try what you usually do, it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And it's so much fun to bring, like, I was a, or I am a film director, and then, but I've always think differently. It's so much fun when we bring like filmmakers and writers and people from the traditional video game or film industry. So they're like, what do you mean I cannot frame? What do you mean there is no focus? It's like, no, 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 no. Yeah, and, and it doesn't work. I mean, when you try to do it traditionally, it doesn't work. So it, it, it forces you to be innovative all the time and to prototype all the... That's, a, that's another fun thing. So I, I, I came into this with a very, uh, like, technology innovation background. So for me, prototyping is the norm. Right. But in film, this is like an, an yeah, sure. unknown thing. Well, it's also really expensive, typically, right? I mean, uh, not these days, but like yeah, so until so very we, recently. So what we started to do, which usually in film you don't do, is like doing previews, like pre-visualizations of the things that we're going to do, or we fake it with like, like bad cameras, like, like cheap cameras, and just, you know, ourselves. But you need to test it out. Right. So how, does, how do you think VR movies will look like? Is there such a thing as a VR movie, even? I don't think we're going to call them movies. Okay. I think there's going to be experiences that are going to be more or less interactive. So it's going to be you know, movies and video games and everything in between, but mm. we're not going to call them movies anymore. Um, there are so many fascinating things that are going to happen. First of all, I think uh, they're going to be way more interactive than they are right now. Immersive, of mm. course. You're going to feel like you're inside of the film. But you're going to start to have characters that react to you. Characters that mm. are AI-driven. Right. And when you actually do something, they react to your emotions. And in a lot of ways, we have this in computer games today, right? Yes. I mean, so in a, in a somewhat really smart, yeah. primitive way. Exactly. But uh, in the future, so what I see is that we're not going to be filming the real world anymore. Like in about 8 to 10 years, everything's going to be CGI generated. You're not going to be able to tell the difference between that and like, like virtual and real. Right. So everything we're going to do with a computer so we can do it, so it can be modified in real time. And you are going to be able to, like, to change the background and change the sky oh, right. and the characters are going to react to you. And one thing that we're working on, and which I believe is going to be the absolute future of entertainment, is what we call reactive content. So it's content that is not only interactive because you have an input and you do something, but also because it knows who you are. So you'll oh, add inputs like your age, your sex, your location, huh. uh, what colors you love, what kind of music. 
I were gonna analyze your Spotify and say, you know what, for this piece in which we want like relaxing music, let's analyze what music you listen to after 8 p.m., which is when you finish work, and then put something that is similar to that as a background music. I tell you, when you look at my Spotify list, like all the movies I will watch will be like really, really weird and trippy. So I'm, I'm a little shocked about this. Um, do you think we will still have movies? Like movies as in the two-dimensional version and, and the collective experience of us going into a movie theater, right? Like the, the Star Wars premiere, right? Where we all like queue and like... So movies per se eventually I think will disappear the same way I mean there will be some the same way we still have some black and white films or yeah. silent films okay uh, but this is gonna be a rare thing it's not right. gonna be the norm um, the collective experience for sure it's gonna have a different shape it's gonna have a shape in which you're gonna have mixed reality experiences like the void is doing where you're gonna go to a place and you're gonna be physically with your friends but in a virtual reality where you're all interacting or you're going to have the social experience virtually. So you're still going to connect with somebody on the other side of the world and experience in film, and you're going to watch it from uh, one of the characters' perspective, and I'm going to watch it from the other one, and we're going to share the experience way more than we do in a movie theater. In a movie theater, I'm looking at the film, right. and I'm not looking at you, I'm not yeah, talking sure. to you. We talk about it afterwards. But if we are both inside the film, and each one of us is a character, and we can influence what the other mm. one is seeing or experiencing that's that's social for real interesting and do you think the the medium will be uh, so vr today is the tethered head typically tethered headset it's pretty clunky like it's not super comfortable to wear for like really long periods of times so it's kind of antisocial like what do you think the 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 hardware side of it where does that yeah. evolve because it needs to evolve right i i, I really can't see us like wearing these things 100 like... percent. it's just a matter of, of of how much time it's going to take mm -hmm. uh, what i see is first of all what i see is like there's not going to be a difference between ar and vr you know we continue right. doing you know saying like vr is dead because ar is on it's the same thing it's just how many layers you have in front of reality so it's going to be the same device you're going to go from AR to VR like that. Depends on the app that you're working on. So now we're going to have a conversation. Let's right. go to Bali and have that in VR. Yeah. Uh, but now we're having an interview, so let's have a mixed reality in which yeah. you know, you're, I'm a hologram, but we're seeing the background. Um, so same device, that's for sure. Same kind of content, same platforms. Yeah. Um, eventually, that will evolve to contact lenses, something like very light. Uh -huh. And eventually, what I think it, it makes more sense. So we try to emulate how we feel. We're using a lot of haptic technologies to, you know, to feel. To but like the whole body, that's a pretty big organ. It's very difficult to mimic how you feel by touching, right. smelling, hearing. What I feel is that it's way easier once we solve how the brain works. It's gonna be way easier to tap into our right. optical nerve and say to the brain, "This is what you need to see." And that's what I envision the future of VR to be. That's, a, I don't know, 25, 30 years, but it's going to happen. So David Roberts, who's faculty here at uh, Singularity University, um, I think he spoke yesterday here at the, at the conference. Um, in one of his talks, he also talks about like this idea that the virtual reality, the virtual world will be better than our own reality. And, For sure. uh, you know, higher resolution, you know, we will have cap capabilities which we don't have in our physical embodiment. And thus we might choose to live our lives in those virtual realities. Mm -hmm. Is that a positive, I mean, you, like, it kind of like, it brings up this like, oh wow, this is like the matrix, you know? Particularly yes, if is. you like think about like neofrontal cortex, like brain computer interfaces, etc. That's definitely gonna happen at some point, at least it's a possibility. I'm not sure if we're all gonna get there. There's a lot of philosophical implications and it's fun because I, I got deeper and deeper in the philosophy behind VR and, and every time so since starting uh, since starting at SU and every time it's like I'm here and we're discussing about uh, going to explore all the planets and going to like expanding and it's like and when I think about it it's like it's much more likely with the exponential curve of technology that in 40 or 50 years we're able to download our conscience into a virtual reality made for ourselves that has 
infinite possibilities in which we are gods because we can control every outcome of it and that we just live in multiple universes then that we go and expand and create like Dyson spheres to control energy. So why would you mm. do that? Which is one of my favorite Fermi paradox explanations. It's like uh, if you can create a virtual reality that simulates this and is 10 times better and you don't need your body anymore, why would we, you know, if this is what we agree to call reality, right. but it might as well be a simulation that we still don't know the code for. <laughs> for sure. That gets us into a deep rabbit hole, which we can like spend the next like, you know, yeah. years yeah. on. <laughs> yeah. I'm curious, so um, this is a conversation about VR. It's important, I think it's important to understand, like, it's not a conversation about just storytelling and media. And you actually made an interesting, bold statement where you said that you predict that VR will affect half the world's industry within a decade. Can you elaborate a little bit on this? Like, what does this mean? Well, first of all, there is a lot of industries that are directly affected by it, like medicine or education mm -hmm. or uh, transportation, well, transportation not, but like, like uh, teaching people how to use things, uh, entertainment for sure. So all of those are going to get disrupted by VR because it makes more sense to experience those things in VR. It's cheaper to produce, you can massively put it out there, uh, you can learn way more, and it enhances our human experience. At the same time, I think VR has the capability to start changing our minds, mm -hmm. to start changing who we are as human beings. And this is, again, getting deep into philosophical realm, but in the end, it's like, when you're a, if I'm able to transport you to 2,000 years ago and make trick your brain into thinking you're actually there, and you spend there like five hours or 12 hours or five days, for your brain, you've actually been there. So you've traveled back in time. I can also do that forward. Right. I can connect you with beings that you love that are not there anymore. So reality becomes something that you know is not so certain. And that will definitely affect how we see the world, how we connect with each other. It's the same thing that happens with psychedelics. Like it's like a different reality that shows you things that you wouldn't even think they existed, huh. and it will give you a different perspective on life, on who you are, on, on where we is this a, I always use this example. Like since the invention of the microscope, we didn't know that in every cell of oh, our yeah, scene there is you know there was a million other yep. beings. Same with the telescope. We thought yep. we were at the center of the universe until we got technology yep. to see there was something Absolutely. else. So I, I feel VR is going to make us reassess who we are. And that will obviously impact social, political, every wow. kind of thing. Those are really deep questions, my friend. This is amazing. I'm curious, um, you're doing stuff today and you won a bunch of prizes for films you actually have produced, which you have made. And you're going to Venice, correct? To the Venice Film Festival. Yes. In, Tell us a little bit about this. Italy. Tell also our audience, like, where do they find your work? Because I'm pretty sure, like, everybody's like, you know, <laughs> sitting there with their uh, Google Cardboard now. Yeah. It's like, oh my God, I want to experience this. So the things that we're working on. So as I said, we decided to start on the on the content side as a studio to figure out like the storytelling side of mm -hmm. it. Now we're we're diving into the technology. So we've been working with uh, big Hollywood studios to produce their VR films for additional original content as well. Uh, we are mostly, you can see our work at, at film festivals like the, the Italy Venice Film Festival or like any other of the big ones. Uh, but it's also on any VR platform. You can go to the Oculus Store or to Steam or to Daydream and you're going to find our content there. So they have uh, to look for what to find it? Future Lighthouse in any of the VR okay. uh, distribution Perfect. sites. So Lighthouse on all the content platforms? Yeah. And tell us a little bit about like the, you have made two fee, quote unquote feature films, right? A what, sorry? Two like feature films, quote unquote, in VR, right? Like you've got two pieces which have won significant prices. Yeah, so we, we, we have premiered one already called Tomorrow, uh -huh. which is actually I wrote that one while I was at GSP. Uh -huh. And it's a pretty cool one because it talks about VR as a new language not a new technology, but a new language, something that will teach us new words to understand new realities. 
Uh, that one can even be watched on, on YouTube. It's a five-minute okay. small piece, but it's very uh, touching into the, the subjects of like singularity. Cool. So that's tomorrow, right? That's called tomorrow. Uh, the other two original productions that we have produced are Melida and Ray, and those will both premiere uh, next month at Venice Film Festival Fantastic. and Ray Film Festival. That's awesome. All right, let me ask you one last personal question, yeah. um, and it's a yes or no answer. Okay. So, with everything we have talked about, is this here already a simulation, or is this real as in real? <laughs> The answer, I would say, the short is yes. The slightly longer okay. is we have way many more chances of being a simulation than not. I want to believe. Okay. It's like, yeah. All right. So you guys out there watching this on Facebook Live, uh, you're clearly in a simulation because you're just watching like something weird, like atoms being transported to you and electrons. Um, Nicholas, thank you so much for being thank here. You. It was super fun. Really check out his content. Um, keep an eye out on Future Lighthouse. They're producing incredible, incredible content. Good luck for Venice. It's going to be amazing. I'm sure it will be. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you.